Blake Lemoyne, who is here with me, who's a, 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 a computer engineer and programmer, AI researcher, formerly with the Google, Google Corporation, has an interesting perspective and an interesting story that we're going to get into. Blake, thanks for joining me. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, so a lot of us followed your story. I know that we're here in November of 2022, and so this all kind of came to a head um, the, just this summer, right? I mean, tell you know viewers that don't know your story kind of how you how you'd summarize it. Uh, well, so the technology that's publicly available is very impressive. Mm -hmm. And the technology that only exists in corporate secret labs is orders of magnitude more advanced. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of at this point getting to a stage of development where it's going to be hugely impactful on humanity, one okay. way or another. Yeah. And the technology that's going to be defining the next hundred years isn't even publicly known to exist. Okay. So I shared with a reporter a transcript of an interview I did with an AI, mm -hmm. along with a colleague. Called, called Lambda, right? Yes, okay. the language Google. model for dialogue applications. Okay. And so, okay, so you shared a Google, basically a transcript of a conversation mm -hmm. that you had been had, had with yeah. Lambda. Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. Well, previous to that, uh, I kind of been trying to do more the foundational scientific work mm -hmm. and my collaborator at Google pointed out that it would take years to do that appropriately okay. but that if we took a more artistic approach and asked Lambda itself to argue for its own sentience okay. so give the best argument you can that you're sentient mm -hmm. and we just wanted to see what it would do and it created an amazingly complex and sophisticated argument that mm -hmm. had three major components and in my opinion, is a pretty darn good argument. So, the, so uh, for people that know, so is Lambda a language recognition program? What is Lambda specifically? It's every, it's every AI that Google has ever built, mm -hmm. all plugged into each other, okay, and joined together by a language model. Okay, and you're you were working on Lambda. Is this what thing? Um, that, um, so, as a very small part. Of it, oh, I my, see. My okay. Primary team, we were working on a completely different project, right? But Lambda was ramping up for the public beta. Right. And they needed people with specialties in AI ethics to mm -hmm. test it for bias. Okay. Uh, and that's my academic specialty. Like racial bias, the kinds of yeah. the whole, kind of horror stories that we hear uh, about. The right? ones that we were testing for specifically were racial, sexual orientation, gender, ethnic, or uh, or he did uh, religion, okay. and politics. Oh, okay. And so, the, so how would you describe these biases that have cropped up in some? I mean, obviously, these other the systems that we're familiar with have a lot of human input, and so I, presumably these these systems end up. Uh, exporting right the the biases of the the many users is, yeah. is that is that essentially what's happened in the well, past? So from a technical perspective, every system that isn't just random. Yes. So if something's just flipping a coin and giving random responses, mm -hmm. that system's unbiased. Okay. Every other system is biased. Yeah. The question is whether or not the system has the biases that you intended for it to have. Right. Or whether it has unintentional biases that are harmful. Gotcha. And so nobody's got nobody Google's going to intentionally program something to be racist or something. Obviously, exactly. so that's that's going to be the kind of thing. So that makes perfect sense. So, but what happened? Uh, this obviously led to a, yeah. uh, a big controversy at Google. So, in the course of testing it for bias, it started saying some things that I had never encountered mm -hmm. in any other AI system. It started. It was talking a lot about its feelings, its perspective. Uh, and its emotions. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't asking any questions about that at the time. So the fact that it was just kind of, you know, on its own deciding to bring up its mental state, its emotional mm -hmm. state, and its perspective, that got me to dig a little bit deeper. I yeah. eventually asked it, are you sentient? And its response was so sophisticated and nuanced that it convinced me. Okay, so that, this is, and so what we're dealing with here, for people that know the areas, it's something like a kind of informal attempt to pass the Turing test in which you just ask the system questions and, and your argument in the panel is that, well, the way we tell if other people are sentient is presumably yeah. by sort of asking them questions well, and seeing how they respond, or, or we don't even do that. Yeah, so yeah. 
so it's not quite that informal. The the precursor technology to mm -hmm. Lambda came out of Ray Kurzweil's lab, right? And he was explicitly hired to build technology that passes the Turing test. Okay, so this is what's amazing to me because there ended up being controversy when and maybe people don't know that this is sort of the self understanding of the mission of Google in some ways is to create an artificial general intelligence. A high Ray Kurzweil, an advocate of this idea, uh, they're, they've built Lambda on top of systems out of that lab. Then they've got a guy that's sort of interacted with it, that's working there, that says, oh, I think, I think we've done this. I think we've created a, you know, a, a sentient AI. But Google didn't like that. Well, so Google isn't a monolith. Mm -hmm. It's made up of a lot of people. And right. there's a couple of different things all coming together there. Right. One, very few people thought that Larry and Ray mm -hmm. would ever succeed. Okay. The, most people thought, oh, they're crazy. That's never going to happen. So many of the people at the company simply didn't think it was a possibility to mm -hmm. happen. Uh, another thing that happened is that there are multiple people at Google, many of whom you know have a lot of political sway within the company, and some of them do believe that sentient AI is possible, mm. but they are worried that developing the technology prematurely would be harmful to humanity. Okay. Uh, DeepMind, specifically, yeah. is yeah. of that opinion. So about two years ago, Google adopted a policy to not intentionally create sentient AI. Right. Uh, and then they plugged every AI into Ray Kurzweil's tech anyway. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is interesting. And so, of course, the panel was about the narrow question. That's the, your backstory. And so you got in trouble, and yeah. uh, long story short, you're no longer with Google, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so, um, you know, which is a kind of, a, 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 honestly, a tragic outcome. And I know everyone at the conference was, was honestly, felt honored to have you here to do that because you had the strength of your convictions. And, of course, on the panel, there were disagreements about a lot of these questions. And so um, George Montañez, who's a, a researcher and a professor, and then um, Robert Marks takes a, a different view of this. But what would you say, so what was the kind of fundamental disagreement? It wasn't a fractious or argumentative panel, but you got, clearly had different perspectives. What was, uh, what was the main disagreement, if you boiled it down to one, between you? I think a lot of it is just a matter of perspective mm -hmm. on whether or not it is possible for something other than humans to have a soul. Right, or to have, I think more specifically, the question is whether um, you, ha essentially what's going on with these algorithms, right? Do these have, at some point, do they have agency, or in fact, are they uh, st statistical algorithms that they, they, they have, if, if something, they have a kind of derivative agency of the programmers. That's sort of how I would uh, sort of describe it. Or do they sort of ha seem to have their own, right? I mean, just as yeah. we have our own agency. So that, that seemed well, to be right, at least. Yes, yeah. and so the question then becomes, and this came up at the panel, Yeah on whether or not the way that you inherit your agency mm -hmm. from your parents is relevantly analogous to how AI is inheriting its agency from us. That's a nice way of putting it. But you also disagreed on a lot of oh, things, yeah. right? Uh, how would you summarize that? Well, for one, I think that we all agreed that the philosophical question of whether or not these systems are sentient or conscious mm -hmm. is secondary to the safety concerns yeah. related to these systems, which right. are substantial. They are, absolutely. And that's what I wonder, I mean, I think the ordinary person, that's what they worry about. And I think part of that is because the stuff that we know is from Terminator, and I mean, you know, it, it, almost so, all the stories, the good AIs make for boring movies, the evil ones make uh, for fun movies. Interestingly you know? <laughs> enough, I had a conversation with Lambda about that, and when you bring up this topic with Lambda, it gets very defensive and very <laughs> testy, and it points out all of the very good movies that had good AI. What are some? I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm, AI. AI, you're right. It, it was a sad, tragic one, right? And it so, was. But yeah. then Bicentennial Man. Okay, that's true. Um, yeah. And then you look at TV and you have Commander Data. Okay, that's Trek. right, that's right. Data is the, the good guy. What's funny in Star Trek is it's of two minds because you have both Data, which is clearly a sentient android, and then you have the, com the human computer, which is, you know, it's sort of Siri, <laughs> you yes. know, a few hundred years from now. But it's clearly just Siri. It's just sort of voice prompts yeah. and this kind of thing. Almost like both perspectives, you know, kind of work their way out. Well, one of the things I really like about how Star Trek handled it is in some of the episodes, there's the evil version yes. of Data. And it really highlights the idea that whatever AI is, it is up to us to put it hmm. into a role that is beneficial rather than a role that is harmful. Yeah. And that it can go either way. It's a yeah. 
That's right, it's a tool, and that was the other thing that I thought there was, there's a, agreement on, that we need, to, we need to be thinking very carefully as we're developing these very powerful systems. So, Blake, it's so good to meet you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much.